All right. Well, we um, are going to continue today in our study through the Acts of the Apostles, uh, the uh, fifth book of the New Testament, the historical book in the New Testament, and today we'll come to chapter 8. So I just wanted to uh, review that the book is divided into three uh, sections, if you will, and the division is given by the Lord himself back in the first chapter, where he explained that these men, these apostles, would uh, receive power. And when they receive the power, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, ye shall be witnesses unto me. And uh, that, that's the main thing that we'll observe in the historical book of the Acts of the Apostles, is the purpose of the Holy Ghost and the power of the Holy Ghost is to be a witness unto Jesus Christ. And so these men, we're going to observe historically how the Holy Ghost is going to work with them in Jerusalem, chapters 1 through 7. Today we come to chapter 8, and now they're going to move out of Jerusalem, the city proper, into the surrounding region, Judea, and the region above it, Samaria. And we'll observe that in chapters 8 through 12. And then finally, Jesus will say, and unto the uttermost part of the earth, which will be chapters 13 through 28. In other words, Jesus here, speaking prophetically in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and giving a prophecy of the Scripture, and no prophecy of the Scripture can be broken, this prophecy is going to be fulfilled, and we're going to observe the historical account of the fulfillment of that prophecy as the Holy Ghost, working under the command of God the Father and Jesus Christ, fulfills that which is written in the Scriptures. This is uh, something good for us to get an understanding of, is that I was talking to one of the questions we had last week when I gave the... uh, you know, was given the privilege to give a couple sermons in Scotia, New York. One of the questions that was given to me afterwards was the idea of God and controlling events down here on planet Earth. And in, in actuality, God does not, if you will, control events on planet Earth. He allows a lot of freedom and a lot of liberty and a lot of uh, sin and transgression and rebellion to go on down here on planet Earth. Uh, someday when his kingdom comes, those things won't be going on. But right now he permits this. But, I said you need to think of it like this. If God is the um, conductor in a train, he's up there in the lead, what's that, the engine, you know, of the train. And then there are many cars behind. And God has determined that that train that he is leading is going to start at a particular place in New York City, let's say, and work its way across the United States with a couple of stops in between and end up, let's say, in Los Angeles. That is what he puts down in the Scriptures. These are the major points that are going to happen along the way. They will be fulfilled. This train will not be derailed. However, in the cars behind me, There can be all kinds of partying and rebellion and people walking against the direction I'm going in and jumping out the windows and spitting and all those kinds of things may go on. But this train and these prophecies that I've given are going to make the stops that I said they will make. Those are the prophecies written through the scriptures, the major high points. Do you want to get on board on the train? Do you want to behave if you're on the train? Do you want to rebel? Those are your choices. But I can assure you, no one's going to derail God's prophecies. And what we're observing here in the book of the Acts of the Apostles is a a small historical interlude in the New Testament, the only historical book in the New Testament that is showing the major stops being made and achieved by God and His Holy Spirit through those that work with Him. And if there are people that won't work with Him, well, then the rocks will cry out. I mean, he'll get the stones to do it. But God's going to see to it that any prophecy of the Scripture cannot be broken and will be fulfilled. So today we come to the 8th chapter. Now, we observed in the first seven chapters, and and we've reiterated this, and and, and I want to continue to, if you will, uh, drum it, uh, hammer it into our brains and let the saying sink down in our ears that this book is beginning to the Jew first. Because the gospel of Christ is to the Jew first. So it started in Jerusalem. And God was looking for national repentance of the nation of Israel. Had they repented, then Acts would have ended with the seventh chapter. With them repenting and receiving Jesus Christ. 
And, of course, none of us would be here because they would have entered into the tribulation shortly thereafter, and seven years later, Jesus would have come back and set up the millennial kingdom. But they did not repent as a nation. Now the gospel moves out and beyond, and we're going to observe this as we uh, read. So why don't we come to the 8th chapter tonight, and we'll, we'll start our, our readings right here in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. Just after they had stoned Stephen, and Saul was there uh, holding people's clothes and holding coats while they were stoning him, it says, verse uh, 1, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So the first thing you want to see is that once the nation had determined the leaders of the nation, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders had determined we are not going to receive this gospel of Jesus Christ. We will not have this man to be our Messiah. We will not have, we will not receive his blood. We'll end up having his blood on our hands, but we will not receive his blood for salvation. At that point, the entire city of Jerusalem, following their leaders, begin to persecute the church that God was uh, assembling that we saw in chapter 2 where 3,000 were added to the church, chapters 3, 4, and 5 where 5,000 were added to the church. I mean, there's a group of believers and now they're under great persecution led not by the Romans but by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. So, so there's now going to be persecution of religion against the truth of salvation. And Paul will, uh, Saul will testify to this later in his life and we'll read those testimonies. So what we notice is there's going to be a scattering. And if you look at it carefully, it says they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea, that's outside the city proper, into the wilderness of Judea, and Samaria, that would be the region above Judea. Everyone was scattered except the apostles. The apostles remained in Jerusalem to continue to uh, hold to the truth and stand for the truth in the city of Jerusalem, you're going to find out that these apostles that remained in Jerusalem are the apostles to the Jews. And they're going to stay at their work. And what God is going to send out now are the church members, the church deacons, the church attenders. Because the work of evangelism is to be done by all of us. The work of the ministry is not just for the leaders of the church. It's for everyone in the church. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the faith that was once delivered unto the saints, is a faith that is to be preached. Jesus Christ said that uh, ye shall be witnesses unto me. Ye shall preach the gospel to every creature. Ye shall go into all nations, making disciples of men. This is the faith that we have. Again, you need to examine yourself. Uh, I talk to many people that say they have faith. And they say it's a private faith. Well, if you have a private faith, it is not the faith of the Bible. It's not the faith once delivered unto the saints. The faith delivered unto the saints is one that is to be preached and proclaimed in all nations. That's what God saved you for. is to save you to be a witness unto His Son, Jesus Christ. If you have a silent faith, you do not have the faith of the Bible. You do not have the faith of Jesus Christ. You have a counterfeit faith. And there are many faiths out there. They are not the faith of the Bible. And now, I'm never surprised to hear people give that argument to me about a silent faith when I'm at the workplace when it's in the name of some other peculiar God. I am very surprised to hear it when they claim they're a Christian and that this is something to be private. Those of us that have been involved in, in public street ministry have been perplexed at times to find some of our adversaries to be Christians. That is the most perplexing thing. Who is teaching them? They're not reading their Bible and they're not letting the Holy Ghost speak to them because the Holy Ghost is going to speak to the Holy Scriptures, which is going to bring forth the words of Jesus, which ye are to preach and proclaim the good news to all nations. And be witnesses unto me. So these, these folks are going out. The Jewish apostles are staying in Jerusalem, uh, knowing that the Holy Spirit now is going to work through the others in the church. Amen and amen. 
Amen. The Holy Spirit wants to work with you. He wants to work with all of us. That's his desire. So what happens back in the city? Verse 2. And at the same time, devout men carried Stephen to his burial and great, made great lamentation over him. I was reading through uh, one of the commentaries and it was talking about, uh, just briefly, talking about the fact that, that they buried Stephen. And he said that probably is the right way to handle the Christian body when, when a Christian dies, is to bury it as opposed to cremate it. And uh, he was going on with some things. Uh, scripturally, you will find that is the way that the Christian body is handled. It is, it is buried in, in preparation and in readiness for the resurrection yet to come. However, if one were cremated, the Lord's going to resurrect them anyways. But, but the burial can be done. Now, it is curious today. You know, you hear these environmentalists talking about, you know, there's not enough land and there's not enough space. So I sat down with my calculator and I did some calculating on, uh, on just how much room it would take to bury people, all the present population of the world, six billion people, if you gave everyone a, a burial place that was a nine feet in length by four feet in width, which ought to be plenty. Um, it would require 100 miles by 100 miles, would cover over 7 billion people at a 4 foot by 9 foot uh, place, 100 miles by 100 miles. Now, I mean, drive out in the Midwest, go up in Canada somewhere. This is the entire world's population. If you divide it amongst the seven continents, you'd need the little areas about 30 by 30 in each continent. So there's no shortage of landfill to do this. There's just a confusion of people about mathematics and the size of this earth. God made a big earth that can accommodate everything he's commanded. There's no problem for everyone to have a Christian burial. So I just put that out as an aside. All right. They made great lamentation over him. These were the men that loved the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, we do lament over the loss of Christian brothers and sisters. We don't sorrow as others that have no hope. Because we know they're with the Lord. But the lamentation is made that we've lost a brother. We've lost a, a, a sister. We've lost the fellowship. We've lost the uh, companionship that we have. The friendship that we have. You'll know, they'll know you're my disciples if you have love one to another. And, and we lament over the loss of loved ones. That, that's all right. That's absolutely fine. We also rejoice in the fact of knowing that they're with the Lord when I was making my prayers yesterday. I mean, my mother uh, went on to be with the Lord a few years ago. Yeah, sure, I lament her loss and not being able to talk to her or call her on the phone go see her. But I rejoice knowing where she is. And I also rejoice knowing that one day I will be reunited with her. And then I'll be able to talk with her forever and ever. So what a blessing. But the lamentation is a natural emotion. We're supernatural and we're natural. Verse 3, as for Saul, though, he made havoc of the church, entering in every house, inhaling men and women, and committed them to prison. So the persecution now is going to go beyond just the fact that when they were, let's say, in the common place in the temple, when they were in the court or the treasury, when they were presenting, okay, you've got adversaries there. Now, even if they went home, they could run, but they could not hide. There comes a point where, where the opposition, if you stand for the Word of God, there are going to be some people come looking for you. That's just reality. So, so what do we do? Well, we place our faith. The Lord is my light. He's my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? I have the Lord on my side. But persecution comes. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution Tribulation, these things are going to happen. And here, Saul's making havoc of the church in Jerusalem. He's going into the house churches and, and committing people to prison. Now, my observation is that so many times things that happen on planet Earth like go in full circle. It goes all the way around. So we're looking at the very beginning of the church. And we're looking at the initial persecution of the church. And we've swung thousands of years... But we're coming now, folks, to the time of the end of the church age. And the persecution and the heat's being turned up on Christians. In, in this country alone, which is, uh, has a First Amendment, which is based upon free speech, we're finding Christian speech being restricted legally. 
So, so the persecution is being turned up. Uh, I understand there's a bill right now in progress in California. I guess San Francisco is pushing it that will outlaw spanking any child under the age of four years old. All right. Now we understand from the scriptures that that he that spareth the rod hateth his son. It doesn't say spoils him. It says it hates him. It says, it says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. But the rod shall drive it far from him. The rod and reproof bringeth wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. We understand because of the sin nature that the application of the rod is good. Now, when I was a young boy growing up, it was very common for parents to spank their children. I was spanked a lot. I thank God my parents spanked me. And got me under control. I, I, I mean, I'm enough of a spoiled brat, even with the spankings. Who knows where I would be without them? Maybe wouldn't even be saved. The rod drives the foolishness from the heart of a child. Now, when I see this type of thing coming, it came, since it came right in, they hailed men. They came into every house, entering in every house. If, when these bills pass, if you live according to the Scriptures, and you be a Christian according to the Scriptures, there's a day they're going to come to your house. There's a day when they're going to outlaw the preaching of the gospel that if they find out you're preaching it, they're going to come to your house. They're going to make havoc of the church. These things will come in the last days. It'll come full circle. Maybe we'll get raptured out and it'll only come to the church of the tribulation. And they're the ones that are going to get it. But we'll see the heat being turned up as we get close, as the shadows are projected backwards as the time draws near. And we're, we're beginning to see these things. By the way, I just want to give you my thoughts on that spanking thing. The, the inclination of the average Christian is to, to get politically involved and change the law. And that's the inclination. But what I see is a greater thing. First off, you're not going to win. I can already tell you, Christian, you're not going to win that battle. <laughs> but you can get involved in it if you want. You're at liberty. Do as you please. But what, what ultimately is happening is behind the scenes. Remember the major signposts? See, God's running this train. And I think what they think is in that back car, the caboose, they think if we alter this, we can derail the train. And actually what they're going to do is they're going to help the train stay on track. Because the next stop on the track of God's train for the world is judgment. See, that's the next stop. The world's headed for judgment. See, just before the train hits judgment, one of the box cars goes up with the church. But the rest of the cars get to go into judgment. And what's going to happen is this. God's going to have to judge women, men, and children. During the tribulation, children are going to be judged. Read about the time Elisha, go up thou bald head, and the bear came out of the woods and slew 42 children. And you wonder, how can a God punish children? Well, I'll tell you how. You don't let anyone spank the children before the age of four. Then their hearts are so hardened against truth. They're as good as uh, walking 70-year-olds who are going to die in their sin. That's how he's going to do it. So they're literally helping the judgment come along in their ignorance of the Word of God. Just a, some, a seed for thought. Entering into the church, entering in every house, the churches and the houses, committing people to prison. Verse 4, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went and hid and kept their mouths shut. Verse 4, that's a really good verse. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the Word. Amen. How do we respond to the persecution? Hopefully, as they, they turn up the heat, we just get louder. You turn up the heat under a kettle, see? And you got that tea kettle and you turn the heat up and you know what? It just whistles louder. That's the response God would like out of us. That's the response that happened here in the historical book of the Acts of the Apostles where the Holy Ghost was making them witnesses. When the heat gets turned up, the whistle just whistles louder. Higher and louder. That's the prayer. That's the prayer God has for you and has for me. I was talking to one of the brethren in the church about some, uh, I don't know if it was exactly persecution, but let's say it was the maneuverings of persecution at the workplace to keep him silent. And uh, instead, he responded to the very authority speaking to him by handing that man a tract. That's the way you do it. That's the way you do it. 
I remember when I got called into the workplace about the witnessing and passing out tracts too much. And they went on for a long time. And then they finally said, you haven't said a word. Are you, you going to say something? I said, yeah, yeah. First I want to pray. And I opened my Bible and prayed right in front of them. And then I gave them some verses of Scripture and then left them with a couple of tracts and left the room. That's how you respond to persecution. When it's persecution based on you giving out the Word of God, then just leave them with the Word of God. Leave them with the Word of God. And let God deal with the consequences. He'll take care of it. Listen, do you believe that God is all-powerful? Mm-hmm. When they came to me at the workplace, and I was another Christian talking to me about it, and they said, I guess the word is that they're going to get rid of you or else. And I thought about it and I said, well, you know what? I can only think of it this way. If they get rid of me, then it was God's will to move me on to another region to preach. And if it's God's will for me to stay at this workplace and continue to pass out tracts, he'll get rid of them first. He is God. And lo and behold, within a few months, the chief executive officer of that company was gone, and I was still there, and outlived them for six more years at that same place. So let God handle it. What do we do when the heat's turned up? Just preach the word. Just preach the word. All right, verse 5. So what happens? Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Again, under the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he continues to preach the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, that's what we need to do. This morning when I got up and I was preparing some notes, I had Christian radio on and then turned Christian television on for a little bit. I like to watch John Heggie. But he wasn't on. And, but a guy followed him. And the guy that followed him was, I don't know, charismatic or whatever. And this guy was preaching the Holy Ghost and talking about the Holy Spirit. And I had to wonder about that. And when he prayed, he prayed to the Holy Spirit. And he didn't close his eyes. He looked right in the camera and prayed, Holy Spirit, I say to you, give me the anointing. Give them the anointing. And he preached the Holy Spirit and talked to the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Acts of the Apostles, I see people preaching the Word and preaching Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of the Word. In the volume of the book, it's written about Jesus Christ, not about the Holy Spirit. We're not trying to offend the Holy Spirit. We're trying to obey God the Father and preach Jesus Christ. And Christianity's taken a left turn on the road in the past few decades. And Philip preached the Word and he preached Jesus Christ. And we're going to find this throughout the Scriptures in the Acts of the Apostles is no matter which text they're in, they're going to get to Jesus Christ. And that's the way we need to preach when you're trying to reach people on a personal level, personally reach people, practically reach people. You're trying to reach out with them with the salvation that's only offered in Jesus Christ. We're not so much trying to do a Bible study with them. We're trying to reach them with the salvation and the person of Jesus Christ. And that's the type of preaching of the Word. It's Christ-centered preaching. So if they do ask us a question about somewhere in the Scriptures, like somebody asked me at work last week about some part of the Scriptures, and I can't remember it was in Jonah somewhere, and we took a look at it together, and I said, but do you see how that's a picture of Jesus Christ there? And I wanted to show them Jesus Christ in there. Why? Because He was veiled to them, but He's been revealed to me. And so I can see Him behind the veil in every portion of the Scriptures. And that's what we need to do. When we preach the Word, we preach Christ. That's the only way we're going to get people saved, is by preaching Jesus Christ. Who's the only one that can save them? No man cometh unto the Father but by Jesus Christ. It's that simple. So he preached Jesus Christ in Samaria. He went down to Samaria. I thought that was interesting because when I look at my map, Jerusalem is in the southern part of uh, Israel and Samaria is in the northern part of Israel. But he speaks of it as going down. The reason is because up in the high place where God is, on the mount, where the temple is, today we're the temple. Anytime we leave, we're going down. When we, go, when we go to reach people, we're going down to reach them at their point of need. 
We're always reaching down to help people at the point of need. Somebody reached down to help me at my point of need when I was 39 years old. Somebody came down to meet me where I was. We need to meet them where they are. We need to preach the Word. We need to preach Jesus Christ. He went down to Samaria. Verse 6, And the people, with one accord, gave heed unto the things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did for unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed, and there was great joy in that city. Now, turn back to Mark 16. Because these things aren't going to happen when you and I go out to this. So, so what's the difference? The difference is this. Mark 16. The Acts of the Apostles are an historical narrative of a, of a teaching that Jesus Christ gave in Mark 16. Verse 14. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Again, there are a lot of things I get from that verse. One of the things is I get is a little bit of comfort from the fact knowing that often, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm a man of little faith. And that's been my byword for decades and it still is my byword. I'm a man of little faith. Uh, I believe two things. I believe Jesus is the Christ. I believe the King James is the Bible. Outside of that, I have very little faith. I even have, if you will, little faith in the fact that God would work with me in my life. I have uh, little faith in that sometimes I'll hear a testimony of God working in someone else's life and I'll kind of sort of get it, but I'll have like little faith like well, that would never happen for me. Now, now, that's probably just me and you folks probably all have more faith than I do, in which case I say, God bless you, and I think it's wonderful, and I don't want you to get down to the little bit of faith I have. But when I read this, even the 11 had a little bit of faith right here. They had some unbelief. They had some hardness of heart. That's me. I can number myself among those guys. And, and when they heard the testimony of the women on Resurrection Sunday, they didn't believe it at first, even though Jesus had told them about before time. And so that's just kind of like me. So I kind of see that. It's just so I get upbraided a little bit from Jesus. But, but after the upbraiding, he re, re, reminds me as he reminded them in verse 15, and he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And, and, and even when Jesus catches us at times when our faith is small, he still gets back to the main thing, which is, okay, I understand you're, having a, 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 you're struggling in your walk right now, and I understand personally you're not too sure about where things are right now, but can I remind you there's still lost people out there that need the gospel preached to them? And no matter how you're stumbling about, in the meantime, could you at least help them a little bit? And we'll work all this out one day in the millennium, but in the meantime, would you help those folks and preach the gospel to them? He does get right back to the main points. I love that about him as, as a teacher because as a teacher I watch teachers. I was at a prophecy conference this week and I watched teachers teach. You know, so often I grieve because they, they drift from the main essentials. As a doctor, I get frightened when I watch other doctors and medical students drift from the essentials. Airway, breathing, circulation. Airway, breathing, circulation. You need to keep those at hand and not get lost in the sauce of the periphery. And, and Jesus just brings us right back to the main essentials. Hey, there's lost people out there. There's an eternity to be dealt with. Uh, I died for them. Would you go preach the gospel to every creature. Yeah, you've got some unbelief and hardness of heart. Don't let that stop you from getting a couple tracks out. Don't let that stop you from leaving a good message on your answering machine. That's a great way to, to, to get the word to somebody. I don't have an answering machine, but if I did, I can assure you there'd be a message on it that just said something like, uh, sorry, I, I, I missed your call, but someone that will never miss your call is God. Because God says, all call upon Jesus Christ shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. That's something simple like that. And get an opportunity to get the gospel out. Jesus reminded these 11 right here. Go in all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Then he says, verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. 
but he that believeth not shall be damned. And we talked about this last week at the meeting we had in Scotia, New York. <laughs> now, if you're reading that verse carefully, I already know what your mind is thinking. I already know what your mind is thinking because my mind thought the same thing. And everybody's does. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, that must be talking about water baptism is essential to salvation. But that shows the natural, physical, carnal mind thinks naturally and physical and thinks physical water. But Jesus is speaking words that are spiritual and words that are life. He's talking about he that believeth and is baptized. There is one baptism, the baptism into the body of Christ, putting you into the body of Christ that God the Father does with the Holy Spirit. That's the baptism he's talking about. Jesus speaks spiritually, not carnally. I speak to you of heavenly things, he says. Well, what do you think of earthly all the time? And that's the way our natural mind goes, but he's talking about the spiritual baptism. And of course, he that believeth not shall be damned. We're not going to baptize him spiritually. He doesn't believe. He can get dunked all he wants in a tank. He's still damned. It's the one baptism, the spiritual baptism, that he's talking about right here. And then he says... And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, historically, doctrinally, he's speaking to the 11 Jewish apostles. Those 11 Jewish apostles in the first seven chapters of Acts in Jerusalem, did those very things. One of the people that believed was Philip. One of the people that believed was Stephen. Stephen, Philip, Nicanor, those people mentioned in chapter 6, believed the preaching of the eleven. Those folks right there were baptized by Jesus Christ and the signs followed those folks that believed historically and doctrinally. That's the historical doctrinal reference of that passage. Because look how the book ends in the last two verses. Verse 19 and 20. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up, in, up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they, the eleven, went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following, amen. Again, reorientating ourselves, Christian. A lot of us have heard this again, but I, people watching, I want you to hear this. At the time of the Acts of the Apostles, there was no written word for them to carry. So here they are in Jerusalem. Here they are in Judea. Here they are even in Samaria, which is half Jewish. And they're preaching a new thing. It is a New Testament it is the gospel of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Something that was a mystery to those who had been reading their Old Testament. Someone that was a mystery to those Jewish people. And the only way God could do it was confirm the word with signs until the word of God was completed. And that was the sign as God's word was committed to paper. But before it was committed to paper, God confirmed the word with signs. That's historically what we're reading in the Acts of the Apostles. So that's why, when we turn back to Acts chapter 8, we see that Jesus is fulfilling these things. Acts is a transitional book as God is transitioning between the Old Testament to the New Testament at a time where nothing was yet committed to paper. And so you couldn't say, well, hey, read this verse like I do with people. Isn't that what you do with people? You open the Bible and say, here, read this. Here, here, read what this says. Well, there's no way I could say. There was no Acts uh, 16 to read. There was no Romans uh, chapter 4, 5, and 6 to read. There was no John 3, 16 to read. There was nothing I could give at the time. All they could do was preach, and God had to confirm the word with signs to those Jewish men that had been preached to by the eleven and had had their hands laid on them. Acts chapter 8. All right, back where we are. So, when Philip preached, God confirmed the word that he preached with the signs. The signs worked because the power of God unto salvation is the power of God unto creation. God has all power. And there was great joy in that city. Verse 8. Verse 9, But there was a certain man called Simon 
which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that uh, himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, Oh, this man is the great uh, power of God. And to him they had regard. They really thought highly of him. Uh, maybe wore a long robe and, and something on his head. I don't know. Maybe sat on a throne. I don't know what he did. And they had great regard for him, from the least to the greatest, because out of a long time he had uh, bewitched them with sorceries. Now, I just want to stop for a moment there and you think, well, you know, hey, this is the 21st century. And those were just uh, backward knuckleheads walking in dirt back there 2,000 years ago. There's no way any sorcerer like Simon could deceive anybody today. I mean, we're, we're scientific. We're technological. We don't believe in all that hocus pocus. There's no such a thing like that going on today. Or is there? I don't know. I got a few books here. Uh, I, I, I watch uh, a little bit of television here and there. There's this channel called the Discovery Channel and the History Channel. And they do every so often these documentaries on this particular guy that people are still enamored with today. Uh, some, some great one uh, must have the power of God on him. Uh, bewitching people with uh, prophecies and, and sorceries. Uh, somebody by the name of Nostradamus. You ever heard anybody mention his name? Think anybody believes him nowadays? They do documentaries about him. I hear people talking about his prophecies and, and what he predicted would come true and he must have had power of some sort on him. The secret prophecies of Nostradamus. I was reading here in uh, his own uh, writings. He's writing a letter to his son. Uh, these are my dreams. Uh, these are my prophecies. I give them to you in this form so that you may choose the way for yourself. Um, I offer a message. The message is the end to ignorance, an end to violence, a calm and beauty and greenness. May they prevail on the earth, prosper, love, and create. Go then in peace. And then I was uh, reading some of the history of his uh, particular prophecies. Now, the prophecies are written, he, was, he wrote in French. And this is a translation into English that was done in the uh, 1940s. Uh, the, it's, uh, he wrote in things called quatrains. And uh, they were a series of four verses together. And he wrote 100 groupings for every century as to what supposedly was going to happen. Uh, the edition that came out in uh, 1670, 1672, the true prophecies or the prognostications of uh, Michael Nostradamus. And this is the French text. Uh, these uh, strange, broken, and often incoherent nature of the quatrains in the original French and in the translation in English is the hallmark of this uh, prophetic media. We must uh, clear up that the word prophecy can, is not to be used in the literal sense to apply to every one of the quatrains. A good number of the verses have reference to events back in the days before and during the time of Nostradamus, events that distressed, pleased, or shocked him, recorded for posterity. But we do urge you to uh, look into these prophecies of the future with our blessing. Now, I just want to tell you, uh, people think he's uh, a great prophesier. I just uh, grab a couple of the prophecies that were made for the 1900s because I keep hearing someone told me this week about uh, Nost Nostradamus and uh, how his prophecies, he hit on a lot of prophecies. I said, yeah, but he missed on many more than he hit on. And um, page 313, there's a quatrain that was given for the uh, 20th century. About midnight, the leader of the army shall save himself, vanishing suddenly. Seven years after his fame shall not be blamed, and at his return he shall never say yes. The prophecy is interpreted as this puts forth the prophecy of Adolf Hitler that he will return alive seven years after his supposed death in 1945. I guess, I guess that didn't happen, so there's one we can chalk up. People still think he's a great man. Here's, here's an interesting prophecy that I found that they didn't comment on. It's on page 336. This is literally, in French, I was bringing it across, in the year 1999 and seven months, that would be July of 1999, from the skies shall come an alarmingly powerful king uh, to raise again the great king, the Jacquere, before and after, and Mars shall reign at will. Prophecy is in July 1999, a tremendous world revolution is foretold with a complete upheaval of the existing social order, preceded by worldwide wars. Nostradamus reveals his mystic knowledge of the great secret 
of the book of Revelations and solves for us the identity of the beast of the apocalypse uh, in agreement with the prophetic vision of H.G. Wells and others gifted in history uh, and science fiction. Nostradamus actually ties the date 1999 when the skies from the sky shall come an invasion and Mars shall reign at will. This is the time when the war of the worlds is to be accepted literally. The book was written before 1999. It was written in the 1940s. Well, it's uh, 2007 now. I don't remember any world war uh, coming down from Mars in 1999. He uh, missed on more prophecies than he hit on. You can read through them, and they're so vague, the prophecies. Great men today uh, say, well, that was Nostradamus. Nobody believes in that stuff today. Here's a book that I just found at um, Barnes & Noble. It's called The Death and Afterlife Book. James Lewis uh, writes it. He's a, one of the, he's contributed to a book called Religious Leaders of America. He wrote a series called The Churches Speak. He's the author of The Dream Encyclopedia, The Almanac of Magic, and uh, he's a world-recognized authority, the editor of the only academic journal now dedicated to alternative religions. He's the chairman of the Department of Religious Studies at the World University of America. He's a great man. People think he has the power of God on him. This is his book on death and the afterlife. I was uh, reading through it, and uh, his first question is, is there life after death? And he says, I'm regarded as an expert on life after death. But to my great horror and amusement, uh, I concede I do not know. I think there is life after death. Science cannot decide the issue either way. Amen and amen. I can tell you that. Science cannot decide it. Um, He says, I believe that this life after death, uh, one cannot realize it by applying the ordinary rules of inference or even through the ordinary ways of learning. This is a knowledge which is neither for the immature, immature nor the young. It's a higher knowledge that needs to be attained. Uh, Of such is the kingdom of God as children understand whether or not there's life after death. Uh, This is some great one. These people are doing research all over the uh, country. Um, There's a number of institutions that they founded. Let me see if I can find them again. I read through the book last night. I was astonished at the things that they are discussing. In the 1900s, the later 1900s, a book was uh, published in 1975 by Dr. Raymond A. Moody. He's considered to be a great one. Uh, Many scientists are looking to him for uh, answers in this area. It's called uh, Life After Life, which describes 11 years of inquiry into near-death experiences. This is the big thing going on nowadays. Sorcery. Bewitching people. Sorcery is um, divination. This man, Simon, was a sorcerer. These men are modern sorcerers under the guise of white coats uh, doing research in academic universities. It's divination, the act of discovering secret things, the act of discovering future events by the assistance of spirits or superior beings. See, they're doing near-death experiences. They're, They're channeling with spirits. They're talking with people that talked with spirits. They, these uh, spirits uh, give them, assist them in understanding things beyond this world. And he talks about the research they're doing now. Let me see, on page 33, I marked this off. I didn't know some of these associations existed. The Association for Past Life Research and Therapies, APRT, founded in 1986, publishes a journal called the Journal of Regression Therapy. It held its first conference at the University of California, Irvine. This is an established institution of higher learning, accredited. People go there. uh, It consists mainly of practicing uh, professionals in psychology and psychiatry. There's another uh, institution that they've started. Let me see, page 198. I was just reading through this. I was stunned. 
I never, I never believed in all this stuff, but some people do. The International Association for Near-Death Studies, founded in 1981, a professional organization, promotes the scholarly study of near-death experiences through conferences, grants, and international work. Psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, Raymond Moody Jr., Kenneth Ring, they published the scholarly uh, journal called the Journal of Near-Death Studies and a quarterly newsletter called Vital Signs. The International Association for Conscious Dying, uh, founded in uh, California in 1990 at the World University of America, uh, focusing on the worldwide problem of AIDS and death. The seminars are taken by medical and healthcare professionals and educators, and they have a newsletter called The Clear Light. These are your modern sorcerers. When you go through the scriptures, uh, for example, the first time you'll see the word sorcerers in, in Exodus chapter 7. And they're involved in, their method is that of enchantment. You'll see it in Daniel chapter 2. They use dreams. This is how a lot of the research has been done, so called through dreams and interpreting dreams. Um, you read in the scriptures that uh, they're going to get judgment, Isaiah 47, Isaiah 57. You read about sorcerers like Simon in this chapter. You read about this, the sorcerer in uh, chapter 13, uh, Bar Jesus Elymas. But in the book of Revelation, as the most references, and the references are that sorcery will increase in the end times. Now, there's a couple of uh, magazines my wife had around the house. One's called Family Circle and one called Woman's Day. And in these particular magazines, okay, there's a, a recipe for stuffed cabbage with cranberry and tomato sauce and pizza in a bowl and stuff like that. But in these very magazines, there are advertisements for uh, a psychic who overpowers all problems of life, have never failed. Uh, sure. Uh, one call will convince you. Your first reading is free. Call 1-800. Here's another one. Uh, Sheila, 40 years experience. A God-gifted, powerful methods. Again, having the power of God. Many of these people attribute their power to God. What does the Bible say about people like that? Well, it tells us what to do with them back in the book of Deuteronomy that you're to test that prophet. And even if that prophet speaks in the name of God and the thing which he prophesies cometh not to pass, well, in the Old Testament, they were to stone him. In the New Testament, why don't you mentally stone him and not listen to him or her anymore? But sorcery goes on today with educated people. Just because you have a high IQ doesn't mean you can't be deceived. Take your average uh, college professor to a magic show. He doesn't know what that guy is doing up there. And so this goes on this day. This sorcery goes on. And the judgment that's going to come in the book of uh, Revelation is one that's final. The book of Revelation tells us in chapter 21 that these sorcerers that went on back then and they were back in Egypt and they were in Babylon and they were in Israel and they're today in the United States of America and around the world, the Bible tells us that the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, and the sorcerers shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. Yeah, that's Revelation 21, verse 8. And Revelation 22, verse 15 reiterates it. For without are dogs and sorcerers, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. And so we're running out of time. And so next week we'll continue a little bit on this teaching. But there's no new thing under the sun, folks. And you're either going to believe the written Word of God. And, 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 I, and, I, and I say this to you, especially if you're a Christian. Because nowadays, you know that there are false signs and false wonders. And Satan, who works lying wonders and false signs. And today, Christians are looking for signs and God's given you the written Word of God. Revelation is now completed. We're reading the book of Acts. The Bible hadn't been written in the New Testament. We're reading now after Revelation in the 21st century. The Word is here. And God wants to know, what are you going to trust more? Your own eyes and what you see or what you have heard in my Word? And God's putting your spirit to the test. You need to try the spirits. Don't believe signs and wonders. Believe what's written in the Bible. So we'll take questions after the camera's off. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the acts of the apostles. And it is hard for us, Lord, as we step back in history, as you work transitionally 
to understand sometimes, gee, why can't we produce signs and wonders like uh, Philip and Stephen did? But Lord, um, now we understand the word is written and the signs are, are finished for now until you come back in the second coming. But the greatest sign we have is the sign of the cross of Jesus Christ. And we need to preach the word and we need to preach Jesus so that people can be born again and then see your return. And that's the prayer we have. Make us witnesses to all nations. Help us preach the gospel to every creature. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.